All right, so we, we're continuing in the uh, epistles of John. We're in chapter 5 now, and we're going to cover verses 1 through 10. And what I wanted to emphasize today in this particular message is putting righteousness in its right place. Putting righteousness in its right place. You know, we human beings, we all have our forms of righteousness. That we like to think that are our pet peeves, that somehow we have a standard that we set as human beings for other people and how they have to behave towards us. And we like to think that those standards are high standards. And we like to think that those standards are based on scripture. But oftentimes if we're really objective and we really take a look at what we believe, why we believe it, and how we came to believe that, it's erroneous. It's erroneous. And the scripture says that our righteousness are as of filthy rags. And what we have to do is we have to make sure that our righteousness is in alignment with Messiah's righteousness. And so as we're going through this particular part of John in chapter 5, in the first 10 verses, we're going to start to take a look now and move away from the subject of love all the time that we've been going through has been driving me nuts talking about love from so many different angles but now he's starting to move into the area of righteousness and so this is what we're going to go through here today to try to define where our priorities need to be in regards to righteousness because there's different kinds of righteousness there's human righteousness there's righteousness of the Torah and then there's the righteousness of Yeshua and so we need to make a clear distinction about those three particular areas and which one should supersede all of them and make sure that we've got it in the right order. So let's go ahead and look at verse 1. Whoever believes and puts their spiritual well-being into that Yeshua is the Messiah is born through procreation and is regenerated of Yahweh and everybody who loves him, Yahweh, who begot through procreation and is regenerated also loves Yahshua who is begotten through procreation and is regenerated of him, Yahweh. The him is Yahweh the Father. Verse 2, by this we know that we love the children or the sons of Elohim when we love Yahweh and keep and observe and perform his commandments, which is an authoritative prescription. For, and it's interesting this word for actually means no doubt. No doubt this is the love of Yahweh that we keep as to guard from loss or injury his commandments as an authoritative prescription. And his commandments are not burdensome, heavy, or weighty. Now, this is going to be a little interesting. Because in Matthew chapter 23, verse 23, it says, Woe with what grief to you, scribes, professional writers, and Pharisees who are exclusive separatists, hypocrites, who are actors under an assumed character. For you pay tithe of mint and anise from the dill and cumin, which is fennel, and have neglected and forsaken and let go of the weightier, heavier matters of the law. Now wait a minute. Yeshua just got done saying that the law is not weighty or heavy. But I'm going to talk about that in just a little bit moment. Let's move on. The law of Moses which is justice is a decision or for and against based on divine law and mercy which is compassion and that's what I feel a lot of us need we need to develop the spirit of compassion more and not be so judgmental as necessary and binding for you to have done without leaving the others undone or forsaken now going back here just for a moment For no doubt, this is the love of Yahweh that we keep as to guard from loss or injury his commandments as an authoritative prescription, and his commandments are not burdensome, heavy or weighty. But we just got done reading in, in, in Matthew that the weightier matters of the law is mercy, justice, and faith. Justice is mishpat. Okay? What I want to say is this. If you don't implement mercy, justice, and faith 
from the Torah and you just operate from the letter of the law where justice, mercy, and faith are not included in your judgments when dealing with other people, then what happens is that does become a weightier aspect of the Torah. Because what happens is when you refuse to use justice, mercy, and faith on another person in a matter of dispute with another person, it does become weighty because then what happens is it goes back to what Yeshua was saying. He says, be careful with what measure you judge another person. Lest it come back on you and then some. So what's going to happen is the weight of your intolerance is going to come down on top of your shoulders and is going to press down on you and that law is going to start to work against you. And so what we have to do is we have to make sure that if we want mercy, we need to extend mercy because scripture also says he who extends mercy will receive much mercy in return. But he who implements the heavy matters of the Torah in an unrighteous kind of way, then you're going to get more of that coming back on top of you as well. And that means your life is going to become very, very difficult and very grievous. So what's meant to be not heavy or weighty actually becomes heavy and weighty for you. And so we need to be really, really careful to make sure when we're dealing with somebody else, please give the benefit of the doubt before you open up your big trap and you wind up getting your foot stuck right in it. Man, I see this all the time. You know, Solomon says, be quick to hear, but very slow to speak. And man, because it used to be, <laughs> it used to be in a few, a few years ago, I could perceive exactly what somebody's doing because Yahweh would reveal it and I'd speak it out and be dead on accurate. And there was nothing wrong with what I said. I pegged them exactly and they'd get mad about it. And I needed to tell them, okay? But then what started to happen is Yahweh started to play a trick on me. And what he started to do was, he started to, I started to peg people on certain things. And then all of a sudden, fortunately I didn't say anything in these cases. All of a sudden, one after another, I hear the person start telling their story. And I found out that what I thought was going on had no relevance whatsoever. No relevance, I said. Oh, man, am I glad I didn't open my big mouth because I would have been a huge fool. And then I started noticing it was happening one after the other. And where I used to be able to say exactly what was going on was not happening anymore. And I'm like, Yahweh, what are you trying to tell me? And what I believe he was trying to tell me is I can give you the gift of discernment. And you can know exactly what's going on in the heart of a person, what their intents are. But don't get so cocky that you think it's always going to be there because I can pull it out whenever I want and I can leave you exposed if you're not careful what comes out of your mouth, which is coming from your heart. So I've got to be careful because at any given moment, our righteousness can go from a pure righteousness where Yahweh's imparting to you wisdom and understanding and discernment about a given search away, a situation, but then he can remove it just like that, just to let you know you're not in charge. And now you're relying on your own righteousness in a given matter, and if you're not careful, you're going to get called out. So don't think that you're high and mighty and everybody else is below you. Oh. So it becomes a, 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 it becomes a situation where we need to be very cognizant. And I say it before about having spiritual acuity to be able to discern and know right away whether Yahweh's with you when he's giving you something like this and when he's not. And that becomes very dangerous if we get so caught up in thinking that we've got everything that we need and then Yahweh pulls it away and you're not even sure when it was pulled away. And then we wind up looking like a fool. So my point is, is that the law is not intended to be burdensome, heavy or weighty, as long as you're working in the spirit of it. But if you're not implementing mercy, justice, and faith, that level of righteousness, then it's going to work against you. And so we have to be very, very careful of that. So let's move on. Well, now we're back to 1 John chapter 5. 
Uh, verse 4, for whatever is born through procreation and is regenerated of Yahweh overcomes, prevails to the point of victory, the world. And this is the victory, which is conquest and means of success that has overcome the world. Our faith, that is the moral conviction of religious truth, i.e. Torah, or Yeshua speaking. Who is he who overcomes, prevails to the point of victory of the world, but he who believes through trusting their spiritual well-being into that Yeshua is the son of Yahweh. So that's got to be where our foundation is. Verse 6, this is he who came by water and blood, Yeshua Messiah, not only by, and the word by actually means the act of, the act of water. So the water is crucial, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who bears witness because the Spirit is truth. Verse 7, For there are three that bear witness, and the, what is underlined does not exist in the original text. I'm sure most of you know that. I'll read it anyway, but it's not really there. In heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, or the Ruach, and these three are one, not in the original, as I stated. And there are three that bear witness on the earth, and that part is not in the text as well. The Spirit, the water, and the blood, these three agree as one. Verse 9, if we receive the witness as evidence given of men, the witness as judicial evidence given of Yahweh is greater. It's greater. It holds a higher uh, degree of accountability than whatever we might get from men. For this is the witness of Yahweh which he has testified of his Son. For he who believes in the Son of Yahweh has the witness in himself. He who does not believe in Yahweh has made him a liar because he has not believed the testimony that Yahweh has given of his son. Now, with that being said, I've read all that. Now I found that there's some really interesting stuff in the book of Galatians that I'm going to cover that relate to this righteousness. And so many people struggle with Shaul because the way he words things, it's almost like trickery. It's legalism. I don't mean legalism in the sense that it's a negative thing. Legalism in the sense that it's spiritual law. And if you don't understand the spiritual law, it's going to twist your brain into a pretzel and you're going to misconstrue what Shaul is trying to get across. So let's go through the text here and what he's talking about. O oh, foolish, unintelligent, and sensual Galatians, who has bewitched maligned with false representations you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Yeshua HaMashiach was clearly betrayed among you as crucified? This accusation only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the spirit of Yahweh by the works as an act of your efforts of the law? of Moses or by the hearing of faith. This is where I think a lot of people get confused. There's a lot of confusion and this is what Christianity likes to use to say, see the law is done away with. We don't need to keep the law. No, this is not what Paul's talking about as we get into a little bit later. The question is, and I think I can ask this of all of us, were any of us keeping the law of Yahweh before he, he called us? Think about it this way. Were any of you keeping the law of Yahweh before he called you? So then, by deductive reasoning, you have to conclude that you did not receive the spirit of faith because you were keeping a law. To the contrary. So what is Paul saying? What Paul's going to do is he's going to start going into a point here. And the point is, is that this righteousness that you get and this faith that you got has nothing to do with the law. The law doesn't contain the spirit of faith. And it's, it's interesting the way he words this because you start looking at it from a different angle that's really very interesting the way he starts conveying this. So let's, let's keep going. Are you so foolish, unintelligent, and sensual? Having begun in the spirit of Yahweh, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? So here we go again. He's reestablishing again this idea that what they got from Yahweh and from Yeshua had nothing to do with law keeping. It's independent of that. 
It's independent. Of, this is what Christianity doesn't really seem to understand. And so Paul is talking about legalities here, spiritual law, and it's important to understand what that spiritual law is in order to understand these concepts of what he's talking about while he's reprimanding these Galatians. Have you suffered with pain and vexation so many things in vain and without reason, if indeed it was in vain and without any reason? Therefore, he who supplies with aid and nourishment the spirit, the Ruach, of Yahweh to you, and works with fervent miracles, with power and strength among you, does he do it by the works as an act of efforts of the law? So when he does miracles in our midst, is he doing it because of the works of the law we do? No. No. They're... They're two separate subjects. They're, they're not li intrinsically linked together in a certain kind of way. Because if you're a lawbreaker, then you're going to bring curse on yourself. So it's hard for miracles to function. So it's really yes and no. But we, the point here is that he's being extremely technical. He's staying right tightly on one focus. This is the point here. Because if we all decided that we're going to go out now, we're not going to keep Sabbath anymore, we're not going to keep the Torah anymore, we will go into the realm of curses and diseases and all kinds of other calamities will come in our life. So you could say directly that by becoming a, bra a lawbreaker, the miracles will stop. Right? Would it not? By deductive reasoning? So what? How can he say this? What he's trying to say is that what, when Yahweh is giving you his righteousness and the righteousness of Yeshua and he's doing these miracles, he's doing it because of the promises that he gave a long time ago, independent of your obedience to the Torah. So let's not mix the two in this particular context. It's, it's a technicality, in other words, is what I'm trying to get across, is what he's talking about here. So let's move on. As an act of efforts of the law of Moses or by the hearing of faith that is a moral conviction of truth verse 6 just as Abraham believed now here we go now we're gonna go he's gonna take us back to Abraham to establish this concept about this righteousness just as Abraham believed by entrusting his spiritual well-being into Yahweh and it was accounted like taking inventory to him for righteousness there was no Torah written down for Abraham, was there? So he can't boast in keeping the law when Yahweh gave him this righteousness. So we can't sit there and say, because I keep the Sabbath, because I keep the rest of the Torah, I'm righteous. But you can, but you can't. You can and you can't. Have you really thought about this? You can and you can't. So then you have to tell, well, John, which is it is or is it ain't? It's both. But it all comes down to how do you want to ask that question? If you're talking about righteous, righteousness according to the righteousness of the written letter of the law, that's one form of righteousness. But this righteousness comes from a higher level. Both of them come from the same point. But this righteousness comes independently of Torah keeping. This righteousness, when you get it, allows you to keep the Torah in the true spirit of it. Remember what Yeshua said in Matthew 5, um, 20 or 21? He says, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, you will not, you will not enter into the kingdom. They keep the Sabbath probably better than I do. So if they're going to rest on the righteousness of the law, that righteousness, they got me beat hands down, probably. But the only reason why I can say my righteousness exceeds theirs and I'm going to the kingdom and they wouldn't be if they stayed in that state is because I'm resting on the higher level of righteousness of Yeshua. That's the only thing that sets us apart in that kind of way. 
Because we know the scripture says there is a righteousness in the Torah. But that's a different kind of righteousness. It's and I'm going to get into that a little bit more. This, this is like, I'm, Paul is really technical. We have to ask these questions in a completely different way if we're going to really understand what he's trying to get across. This is technical. This is why most people don't understand Shaul's writings. And that's why they say, let's get rid of him. He's crazy. He should be in a straitjacket. You know, one minute he's for this, the next minute he's telling you he's against it. No. That's what you call a parent contradiction. But it's not a contradiction. It's all about context. And that's why I'm trying to break this down the way that I am to show, wait a minute, is it is or is it ain't? Yes, it's both. But it all depends on how you want to define it. And so you can't mix them. You have to keep them separate. So let's move on. And that's what people do, unfortunately, is they want to mix them up. And that's why they get confused. Therefore, know that only those who are of faith are the sons of Abraham. Verse 8, and the scripture foreseeing that Yahweh would justify and regard as innocent the Gentiles, which is non-Jewish who are pagan by faith, preached the gospel, the good news to Abraham beforehand. So the good news, the gospel message was preached originally to Abraham saying, in you all nations, non-Jewish and who are pagan, shall be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed by invoking a praise on with believing Abraham. Verse 10, for as many are of the works as an act of effort of the law of Moses are under the curse. See, now we're going back to the Pharisees and the Sadducees again. If they refuse the righteousness from Yeshua, and they're only going to rest on the righteousness contained in the law, which is a righteousness, and it's a good righteousness, and it should not be discarded, it has its place, and I'll get into that a little bit more in a minute, it does not trump the righteousness from Yeshua. Because you can't keep that law perfectly. No human being can keep it absolutely flawless in that kind of sense. In the letter of the law, maybe. But the problem with the letter of the law is the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. And as Yeshua says, that if a man, it was, you've heard it from before, that if a man goes to another woman, he commit adultery with her. But I say, if he looks at her and he lusts for her, He's already committed adultery. Now, under the letter of the law, I could have probably looked at a woman in lust for her, but as long as I didn't actually do it, I'm not guilty. But that righteousness is only to hear. It doesn't go to hear. To go here, you've got to get a different kind of righteousness. A right, that kind of righteousness is going to speak things to you about the letter of the law that goes way beyond the black and white issues of the law. It goes into the realm of the spirit of the law. It goes into the gray area. It goes into that area where Shaul talks about in Galatians, which I'll cover another time, about the all wisdom and spiritual understanding. This is what the, the all wisdom and spiritual understanding cannot be extracted by keeping letter of the law. Because this all wisdom and spiritual understanding is a kind of understanding that comes from this higher level of righteousness where he says to you, with your eyes and with your ears, you see the law stating this. But I'm telling you, what you see is not exactly what you're getting. And for you to understand the true nature of what's going on, you got to get this all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That comes from this righteousness that the letter of the law is not going to give you. Now, when you go into that set of circumstances, you go in with wisdom, you go in with understanding, you go in with power, and you go in with authority because you know precisely how to cut right down the middle of what's going on and let's get to the nut and bolts of what's going on here. And that's when the seed can part in your circumstances. Letter of law ain't going to do that. That level of righteousness is not going to do that. That's why the Pharisees and the Sadducees could not break Yeshua. Because their level of righteousness and the understanding of their law, mixed with Talmud, by the way, could not break Yeshua. Because Yeshua's righteousness was far exceeding their righteousness. They couldn't trip him up. Instead, he tripped them up. 
That's the difference between this righteousness and that one. And this righteousness is higher than our righteousness that we set as standards for ourselves. That's down here. So we need to be able to objectively look at ourselves and say, when I believe that something should be such and such a way, what am I measuring that by? Am I measuring that by my righteousness? The rules that I set up about how people should conduct themselves? Or is it the righteousness over here that the law says, thou shalt not do this or thou shalt do that? Or is it this righteousness up here where Yeshua says, most of the time, it should be this way. But I want you to look inside the heart of this person and I'm going to show you something, if you'll let me, I'm going to show you something in there that not everything is as it appears. And so now I want you to use justice, mercy, and faith, the weightier matters of the law. And I want you to apply that based on what you understand, the makeup of that person and why they're behaving the way they are so that you can help be liberate them. You can't do that with this righteousness and this one. You can't do it that way. So we need to put righteousness in its right place. And that's the only way that we're going to be able to be effective in our walk. To make the right judgment so that it doesn't come back on us and then winds up happening. We got burdens on top of us that are too hard to bear because we're putting heavy burdens on other people because we won't institute that higher level of righteousness, which is justice, mercy, and faith. The weightier matters of Torah. So let's move on. Um, curse. I'm sorry, let's move on. The, the law of Moses are under the curse, and the curse is death, of a, uh, impre imprecating an unannounced evil. That's what that means. It means an announced evil, for it is written, Cursed, excribble, and wretched is everyone who does not continue to stay in the same place and preserve in all things as a whole which are written in the book. Scroll of the law of Moses to do them. So here he's telling us, it stays. That righteousness here, it stays. It doesn't go away. But this righteousness put in its right place with the understanding of what I'm talking about today allows you to take this righteousness in the letter of the law and implement it in your daily lives in a way that becomes effective. Where you move mountains in your life. And that's where we got to get to. That's where I'm trying to get to. Move on, verse 11. But that no one is justified and rendered innocent by the law of Moses. In the sight of Yahweh, it is evident. Because if you're going to rest on the letter of the law, it's not good enough. It's just not good enough. Letter of the law is not good enough. Because when I'm dealing with a brother or sister and I'm dealing with them with a heavy hand of the letter of the law and I'm pounding them over the head and there's no mercy, no justice, and no faith, the weightier matters of that same Torah being implemented and mixed equally, then I, I, can't, I can't get the desired results that I'm looking for. Instead it becomes a millstone around my own neck and I'm going to choke myself to death. And I'm going to become very frustrated. And I'm not going to be able to get the breakthroughs in the light, my life that I want. And strongholds are not going to be torn down. And so that means the works that Yeshua is trying to do through you, he can't. He can't. Because we have limiting beliefs that have restructured this righteousness where this righteousness is not functioning in our life because we're either going by the letter of the law or we're going by our own form of righteousness that we've instituted for ourselves. It becomes our own form of Talmud. We create our own form of Talmud. Forget about Judaism. We've got our own Talmuds. Each and every one. I got my own. Some I'm aware of and some I'm not so aware of. I'm still trying to discover that. Let's move on. Is evident, which is clearly manifest. So we should be able to clearly see this and understand it if we are really in the spirit. And if you can't see it, something's wrong. Because he's saying it's clearly manifest. So we should be able to make those distinctions. 
And if we can't, we've got something in the way that's blocking our mind and preventing our mind from receiving what the Spirit has given to our heart. And our heart's trying to tell our mind, our mind's saying, get out of here. Don't bother me with that stuff. I like my Talmud. I like my hard rules and regulations about how people are supposed to behave. Don't bother me with that stuff. For the just who are innocent and holy shall live by faith. Verse 12. Yet the law of Moses is not in existence as to not, um, as to not, uh, in the word of, means be the source of faith. Now this is what I was talking about before. The, the law of Moses is not, was not put into existence to be the source of faith. Think about it. Think about it. It might be hard, but think about it. The law is not the source of faith, is what he's saying. Faith is a spirit. The law is a spirit too. It's the spirit of truth. It's two different spirits, so to speak. It comes from the same source. has two different purposes. Remember, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. So when the word is spoken, then Yahweh has to send his spirit of truth mixed with that word, and then something happens, right? Think about it, because it might be hard for some to catch it. But listen to what he's saying. The law is not put into existence to be the source of faith. Faith is a spirit it is righteousness that Yahweh imputes on a person without law, which is why he went back to Abraham. Abraham didn't have a written law that he could, he, he could attest that that's where it came from. So too many, too many are relying on the, their obedience to the letter of the law as their standard for righteousness, which is their identity. It's a wrong identity. Paul's trying to tell them, you got it all wrong. Your identity is wrong. You need to relook at this. Your focus is in the wrong direction. You're looking at this completely the wrong way. Okay. Of moral conviction, but the man who does them shall still live by them. So it doesn't mean that because we have this higher righteousness, we cast out the law. We don't do that. What it does is it basically says, I'm now giving you the power to be able to keep the law in its true sense. The spiritual intent of it. So it becomes greater, becomes more magnified, as says in Matthew chapter 5. The anointed one has redeemed and bought us as a ransom, us from the curse of uh, imprecating an announced evil on us of the law of Moses, having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed, Execrable and wretched is everyone who hangs on a tree. So if we're going to become lawbreakers, as so many people are, then we receive the death penalty. We need to be taken out from the death penalty. But man, that's only going to happen if we seek this higher righteousness and put it in its right place. And everything else has to come into subservience to that. But some of us got our own personal Righteous is here, up on top, and everything else that Yahweh is doing is underneath. Wrong order. Doesn't work. It never can work. Verse 14. That the blessing of fine speaking of adoration of Abraham might come upon as a resulting purpose of the Gentiles, who are non-Jewish through Messiah Yeshua, that we might receive the promise, which is a divine promise of good, of the spirit Ruach that is divine of Yahweh through faith. Here again, we're back to the hearing. And that's where the only way that kind of righteousness is going to come. It comes through the hearing. It's a spirit. It's not through the written letter. They work together, but they're two separate entities, so to speak. And too many people are trying to mix them together as one, but it doesn't work that way. And this is what he's trying to say. Oh, wow, what happened? Forgot where I was. 14. 14. 14, thank you. So busy running my mouth, I forgot where I am. Okay. Mm, I finished that. Okay. 
Okay, verse 15. Brethren, I speak in a systematic discourse in the manner of men. Though it is only a man's covenant and contract, yet it is confirmed, which makes it authoritative, and no one annuls to the point of neutralizing or adds as a supplement to it, i.e. Talmudic Judaism. That's what we're told in Torah, not to add to it, not to take away from, and that's exactly what they do with the Talmud. So what was a certain level of righteousness now got dropped that way down to the human level of righteousness because it's man's ideology mixed with Yahweh's word, and now it's something else entirely different. So we're down to the lowest form, if you really want to think about it. When he, when he talked about the righteousness exceeding the Pharisees and the Sadducees, he's really basically saying they're like way down at the bottom of the totem pole with their righteousness because they mix all their other garbage in with it. It's not even Yahweh's righteousness anymore. Which I have to say to a degree helps the Christian because at least at some level, they're trying to do things according to Scripture as best as they understand it, and they're not doing the Talmudic stuff. But on the other hand, Christianity has their own bags of uh, stuff that they mix in with Scripture as well. So, you know, both sides have their issues. Anyway, let's move on. Now, to Abraham and his seed, Yeshua, were the promises, which is a divine promise of good made. He does not say, and to seeds, as in plural, as something sown by sperm, as of many, but as of one. And to your seed, as something sown by sperm, who is the anointed one. So he's making a distinction between Abraham's physical descendants, as far as all the families of the earth that come through that lineage, versus the seed who would become Yeshua himself, the anointed one. Verse 17, and this I say in a systematic discourse, that the law, which is an advise, advisory co uh, covenant will, which was 430 years later, cannot annul or invalidate the covenant that was confirmed before. And what is he doing? He's basically he's going back to Genesis chapter 15, because he's giving us dates here. And Genesis 15 was the first Passover and days of unleavened bread, it was the first blood covenant. And so we know that based on that, 430 years later, to the day, Moses did the Passover with Israel and then took them out of Egypt. To the day. By ratification of Yah by Yahweh in the anointed one, that it should make the uh, entirely make it entirely useless. Okay, verse 17, and this I say, and it, is that the same one? It is. Okay. Got a duplicate. All right, verse 18. For if the inheritance, which is an heirship of possession, and this is the business that we're in, is of the law of Moses, it is no longer a promise. Now, If Yahweh, the point here is if Yahweh promises something, it's not predicated upon you doing anything. Because what, what I get out of all this is that what Yahweh wants is he wants our heart. And it's kind of like, it's kind of like a person that maybe you're not getting along with. And you decide in your mind that you are going to win this person over, no matter how difficult they may be. And so you basically come to that person and say, I don't care what you do, I don't care what you say, how I'm going to treat you with this level of righteousness in mind, how I'm going to treat you has no bearing whatsoever on anything that you might do or might not do. You catching where I'm going? You catch where I'm going? I'm going to treat you with dignity and respect. And I'm going to love you despite what you do or don't do. It's, what is that called in our language? Unconditional love, is it not? Grace. It's grace. Good point. And it's unconditional love. I'm going to do it anyway. I don't care what my eyes see. 
I don't care what my ears hear, I'm going to do the right thing, even if you don't. This is what's going on here. It's not about law keeping, and I'm not putting away the law by any stretch of the imagination. I'm just simply saying, it's a promise. I'm going to do this. Because in Yahweh's mind, he knows that at the moment he's getting ready to call you, you can't fulfill the law anyway. Your heart needs to be changed. Your spirit needs to be changed. The very promise he's giving to you is the very impartation of a heart of flesh that will cause you to walk in his Torah. You'll want to do it. You can't do it before then, as my original question was. Did you guys get saved by keeping the law? No. He called you first, and then you discovered the law. That's the order. This is what Shaul's talking about. We need to get righteousness in its right place. That's the point here. Okay, so let's move on. Which is a divine promise of good, but Yahweh gave as a favor and a grant of kindness as a pardon of it to Abraham by promise. It's a favor. When you decide that you're going to deal with somebody on that kind of level of righteousness, you are giving them a pardon and you're doing them a favor out of kindness. Not based upon anything they do or they don't do. No matter how much they may irritate you. You see, that's what we're being called to. We're being called to this higher level of righteousness. If we decide to put it in its right place, we can then behave that way. If not, we're going to be down here on the letter of the law level. Or down here at our level. Our own Talmud. So we've got to change where we place this righteousness that he's talking about here. Let's move on. What purpose then does the law of Moses serve? So now we're going to change a little bit. So let's talk about the Torah. Where does this fit now in the overall scheme of this higher righteousness? It was added and placed additionally to increase because of the transgressions and violations of it. I'll put it this way. Yahweh kind of showed it to me this way. I've risen a couple of kids, and some of you have. And you lay down a very basic law for your child. If the child obeys that law, you don't need to add any other ones, do you? But if the child decides that they're going to challenge you and become defiant and arrogant, and they think that they're going to bully you, what are you going to do? You're going to lay down more laws. Right? Is this not what we see in our government today? Yeah. They're adding more and more laws. Why? Because people are finding creative ways to get around the laws that currently exist. Because they don't want to be Torah compliant, so to speak, in a social sense. So then the government says, oh, so they figured out a way around it. Now we got to put more laws on top of other laws to regulate it even more. Because you're tricking us. Now we got to find a way to regulate you even more. And we're even told that in Scripture, Yahweh puts these people in authority because of our rebellion. So what happens is it becomes a noose, and it starts to choke the living life out of you. Until finally where society just collapses completely. Because there's more lawlessness and more wickedness, because people are getting frustrated because when they could beat the law yesterday, they can't beat it today, so now they got to go to work, try to figure out how can I overcome this one now. So it's perpetual, is it not? So what Yahweh is saying is that the law was added because of our rebellion and our uncompliance. So now I've got to have to add more stuff because of transgressions and violations of it till, till the seed, Yeshua, as something sown by sperm, should come to whom the promise was made. This promise of righteousness. Because when he comes... He's going to change our heart because he's going to give us a level of righteousness that you're going to say, you know what? I'm out of the business of trying to defeat the law. I see the rationale of law. It brings stability to households. It brings stability to people's lives. It brings stability to society. It brings stability to the nations. It brings stability to the whole world if all the world would just comply. And so what I used to fight against, I now support. That takes a higher level of righteousness. 
that supersedes these other two that I was talking about before. It goes beyond the letter of the law of righteousness, even of Yahweh's word. Because it requires a special kind of discernment that only comes from that kind of righteousness that does not exist in the letter of the law. And arranged as a command through angels by the hand of a mediator who reconciles. Now, a mediator who reconciles does not mediate for one only, but Yahweh is one. Is the law of Moses then against the promises, which is a divine promise of good of Yahweh? Certainly not. With absolute denial of such a thing. That's what it means. That's an absolute denial. I deny that. No way, shape, or form. Is it contrary? For if there had been a law given which could have given life, eternal life he's talking about, truly righteousness would have been by the law of Moses. But here we go again. Because don't we say the Torah is the Ayitz Kaim, the tree of life? He's saying it's not. So which is it? Is it is or is it ain't? And what I would like to tell you is it's both. Because again, this is about... Which context are you describing it in? We're going to get into it a little bit more in a moment where it makes a little more sense. For if there had been a law given by which could be given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law of Moses. But the scripture has confined and closed up all under as to be placed beneath sin. That is an offense that the promise which is a divine promise of good by faith in Yeshua Messiah might be given to those who believe by entrusting his spiritual well-being into. But before faith came, here's where it gets interesting. This is where the discussion splits into two different contexts. But before faith came, we were kept as to mount a guard for protection under as to be placed beneath the guard by the law kept enclosed in for the faith which would afterward be revealed as removing off of a lid so the point or the purpose of the law was to contain you and keep you sanctified and set apart in a certain kind of sense until this seed shows up and then deposits his form of righteousness in you. Do your parents not protect you by giving you laws when you're a child to keep you from running out in the street and getting hit by a car? From some pedophile coming and picking you up out of the front yard and carrying you away and they find you in pieces somewhere in a canal one day? So is that law of your parents not a protection and a guard that that child is under until you can get to the age where your mind can say, you know what, I think I understand why my mother father did, didn't like it at that time, but now I'm thankful that they did it because now I understand why they did what they did even though I didn't like it at the time. It's the same thing, is it not? That's what he's trying to get across. It has its purpose. And it has its level. But that's not the end of it. We need to go beyond that. That's where he's going. Therefore, the law of Moses was our tutor whose office was to take us as children to school. That's what that means. To bring us to a place in the anointed one. Its goal, its purpose, its end result was to bring us to the place in the anointed one. Because all the teachings in the Torah all point to that righteousness. And the one who is going to bring it and deliver it to us. If we should accept it. That we might be justified and rendered innocent by faith. So while you're in that Torah and you have faith in that level of righteousness, and you're kept there as protection until the anointed one shows up on the scene where he now can deliver something to you greater than what the letter of the law will give you, that's a level of faith. It's a lower level, but it's the same spirit of that faith because that law is telling you this man is going to come, this anointed one's going to come, and he's going to give you this kind of righteousness that's going to change your heart, and you will be able to do things that you could never do before. You have to have faith in that in order to continue in that letter of the law. 
And then when Yeshua finally does show up and he delivers the goods, it's just like that child I talked about who says, now I understand the wisdom of my mother and father, why they laid down these laws for me. Now it benefits me. Now I can function in this society because I have rules I was taught that govern my life and give me stability. And now it progresses me to the next level in life where I am now self-sufficient. Now I don't need my mother and father to protect me anymore. Why? Because the law that they gave me is in my heart and now I'm going to teach them to my children. So I'm not under the law anymore. And I'm not under the curse of the law anymore. I supersede it. Because this level of righteousness I have put in the right place and in the right order. To bring us to a place in the anointed one that we might be justified and rendered innocent by faith. Verse 25, but after faith has come, we are no longer under as to be placed beneath the tutor whose office was to take us as children to school. And it's like I said this before to people. I said, when you go to college and you're going to study science or whatever it is, you sit in there under a professor who is a qualified teacher on the subject. You are under that professor, are you not? Yes. You're under his influence, his guidance, and his direction. But once you go through his class and he's taught you everything that he knows and he can't impart any more to you, then what do you become? Are you still under him? No. no. You're now equal to him because you now are in a position to be a tutor just like he is. So now your qualifications have changed. Your level of understanding and righteousness on that subject is equal to his. Maybe you don't have quite the wisdom he has because he has the years on you, but scholastically speaking, you have the same qualifications he does. You have the same diploma as he has. And that means you now can conduct your own class and impart to your students the same thing that he imparted to you. Verse 26, For no doubt, you are all sons of Elohim through faith in Messiah Yeshua. For as many as you are baptized into by reaching to the point of entrance into the anointed one. Remember what I was saying. The law kept you as under guard and protection until this anointed one comes. And now he's saying if you can get to that point, then you can come and you can enter into the anointed one. That's what he's talking about have put on as sinking into a garment, like a garment just sinks over and arrays on you the anointing. So that means the anointing that Yeshua had, when, he come, when you enter into him and he enters into you, it be, you become arrayed with an anointing. And this righteousness now cloaks you. It walks with you wherever you go. It causes you to think very differently than the way you've ever thought before. It completely transforms your identity. Verse 28, there is neither absolutely no Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in the anointed of Yeshua. Verse 29, and if you are Messiahs, then you are Abraham's seed as something sown by sperm and heirs as a sharer in a lot of being pardoned according to the promise, which is a divine promise of good. So, I hope today that I've been able to talk about this righteousness that John is trying to get across. Because he moves out of the love and now he moves into the righteousness. Because they really kind of go together. Because if you want this agape love that's imparted from the Father, we've gone through nine teachings on from all different angles. That love is great, but it also conjoins with this higher level of righteousness. Because it's one thing to get the love, it's another thing to use it wisely. It's another thing to administer it in a righteous kind of way. And you can have love, but if you don't know how to use it in the right way, which is where you need this righteousness from, it's going to be hard to be effective with it. It can be misguided many times. Sometimes... I'll use the analogy, for example, that an alcoholic on the street corner is looking for a handout. Now, 
out of love, out of your heart and compassion for him, you might want to give him five bucks. That may not be the smartest thing in the world to do. You need a certain kind of righteousness that will give you wisdom, not written specifically by letter law in the scripture, but you can pierce and extract from concepts in scripture that this higher level of righteousness will say, no, take him over here and go buy him a cheeseburger. Put some food in him that will nourish him. Now the love is not misdirected, is it? No. And so if he doesn't want it, that's an entirely different thing. And there are many that do reject that. But the point is, is that love without this righteousness operating together is incomplete. So it's our job and our responsibility is to take this agape love that John's been talking about, mix with this higher level of righteousness and put them both in their right place. So let's put them both in their right place and let's keep that at the forefront of our mind on a daily basis as we go through our daily activities and think and meditate how can I get this form of righteousness to function in this set of circumstances where I get the right outcome. Because let me tell you, the devil is going to come. Mark my words, if you try to do this, and if you're not already doing it, you're trying to do it, the devil is going to come at you, and he's going to try to stop you dead in your tracks. He does not want you going down this road. Let's go down this road. Let's tell the devil, we don't really much care what your agenda is. This is what we're compelled to do. This is what the spirit of righteousness that's in me is compelling me to do. And I'm going to do it. I'm going to fulfill it because I want the name of Yahweh or whatever you want to say it written on my forehead. Amen. So that I can stand before the throne of Yahweh where he says, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of Messiah. Amen. Amen.